can take your seats. I have to just say, I got a little overwhelmed just backstage there, just thinking how grateful I am for this house. I don't know if you've taken a moment recently to just be so grateful for where God has placed you, where you find yourself, where he's planted you, the people around you, but, but honestly, we can take so much for granted and we are in a house that God is using to do some incredible things. And I just wanna add my voice to Pastor Chris's to say to you as a church, thank you, because I am standing here as part of this team, which is an unbelievable honor that I even get to say that sentence. And I've told you so much about how I love Pastor Chris and Tammy and the team and you guys. And, but I'm standing here saying to you how grateful I am because just this last week, I've received here as a leader through Grow. My children are in the room and they have received through the Ministry of Motion and PKG. And I want to let you know that you have made a difference in countless lives over this last few weeks. You have you're poured out and served. And honestly, like only heaven will tell the stories of your faithfulness, your giving, your prayers, your serving. So, so when your pastor tells you how much he's grateful, I hope you hear it with the weight he's trying to communicate it to you. There's such a gratitude that God wants to place in you and on you for all that this last week has represented. And I am saying all that to say, it's not gonna get any quieter anytime soon. <laughs> I know that's probably not the message you want after a week where you feel like, oh my gosh, is it finished? Right, you're like, can we breathe? And I, and I probably think you want a message that tells you you can go lie down in a dark room and take a year off, but, but I have no such message because I find it nowhere in the Word. I know we're called to greater and we're called to higher, and you have chosen to be part of a family that believes that and he's doing that and that excites me and I hope it excites you. The Bible says don't grow weary in doing good because at the proper time you will reap a harvest and there is a harvest out there if we don't grow weary and so I love that God wants to speak to us today as a family to let us know and remind us once again that we are called to live at a higher level. We just here on this campus heard through Pastor Blake, he say, lift your expectations. This is a time where as the church globally, we need to start lifting our expectations again, lifting our voice of faith again, lifting our prayers and our asks again. And I think we just had a crazy season over the last few years where we've actually seen a lot of people in the church actually not go higher but go lower like everything that we've navigated maybe even it's something personally maybe a failing or a mistake or a, an upset or an offense all those things come into our life and when they do they have a plan behind them that the enemy has designed to get you to bring your life down to the level of the offense down to the level of the fear i think i think the enemy wants the church to have altitude sickness he does not want us to believe for more and to reach for more. He wants us to come lower and get so comfortable in the lower that we stop believing for anything that's higher. And I think there's just been a season where in the season of us pulling back for some people, some people that used to be in the house front and center, but because of the season we've been through are not anymore in the house. And it's amazing once you start stepping back, how comfortable you become in a place where before you were running from into something greater. And we've got to get that back. We've got to get back the energy and the love and the passion to say, God, I won't settle for lower and call for higher. Isaiah 55, it tells us that his ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. He's giving you a clue where we're supposed to be. He doesn't say his thoughts are lower and his ways are lower, so let's all go lower. He's like, I am higher. And there's no version of that passage that tells us that he's going to bring his thoughts lower or his ways lower to make us all feel better. He's inviting us higher. And it's just time, some of you are stuck. You know, I have a treadmill at my house and I was gonna say that I love to run, but the truth is I love to eat, so I have to run. And so, and so especially from around PC. And, and by the way, just while I'm, while I'm on that, what is a, a broil? What was that thing that the men are gonna do? I was like, 
some kind of broiling of something that you're all gonna eat. Like, I don't understand y'all, the Cajun y'alls, I don't understand, but, but, I, but when I'm around PC, I have to run even more because there's a lot of broiling going on. Anyway, all that to say, I'm on my treadmill and I'm, I'm running and as I'm running, I'm watching, you know, I, I think I'm running up the Grand Canyon because that's what the screen tells me. And so I'm running and I'm going up the Grand Canyon and I'm waving at fake people that are in the Grand Canyon and, and in my mind I've gone there and then, and then I'm exhausted and I get off the treadmill and I'm exactly where I was before I got on the treadmill. In my mind, I've been up the Grand Canyon, but in my reality, I have gone no further than I was when I got on. And I just feel like I wanna to say to some of you from the Spirit of God today, it's time. It's time to stop running and wearing yourself out but going nowhere. Running around the same problem in your mind, the same conversation in your family, the same issue in your marriage. You're running in circles and it's exhausting. But you've gone nowhere. There's a button on my treadmill and it offends me every time I get on my treadmill. <laughs> I didn't ask for it to be on there. I have no reason for it to be there. I don't know why people put it on a treadmill. And the button glares at me and it says the word incline. <laughs> like, like how offensive is that? Do you not realize I'm already working out? Don't be suggesting for me to go up a hill at the same time. I don't wanna work out those muscles, but I feel spiritually like God's trying to draw all our attention that we are built with an incline button that your life is built to go up some things, to go into some different conversations, some different areas. And God's like, it's time for us to push that button spiritually so we can get to where God wants us to be. God has things that are higher. Some of you are praying and you're like, oh God, if you could give me this, if you could give me that. You're praying for things and they're not arriving in your life and you're a little frustrated about it. And before you go into 21 days, church, of praying, I wanna make sure we're praying with an understanding of our praying because you're gonna be frustrated if you don't. And what I've realized about God, he's a really good, good, good father. Like he's a good father. He knows exactly what you need, even if that's not what you think you need. He's a good father, and some of you are frustrated because he's not answering in the way you want him, but that's because he's a good father. And the best way I can describe what happens is that sometimes we're asking for things and we want things, and God has them. He's not keeping them from you, but their levels are higher of where these things stay, and God's asking you to come up. He's not gonna bring it down. In other words, when we have friends over for dinner and our friends come over and attached to our friends are small people, and we don't have any small people in our home anymore, but they have small people, just before they arrive for dinner, I will just say to my family, hey, they're five minutes out, and everybody knows that is code for anything that is valuable must go higher. <laughs> like, go get the ornaments, go get the glass candlesticks, everything of value is going higher. And I'm not doing that to punish the small people. I'm actually doing it to protect the small people. Because the small people don't understand the difference between their plastic drumstick and my glass candlestick. And until they are mature enough to know that this is more valuable than this. I don't wanna put this in their hands because they'll hurt themselves and they'll probably hurt someone else. God's a good parent. And so when you're asking for things, he's like, I'm not trying to keep it from you, but I'm asking you to come up higher so when it comes into your hands, you will handle it with the wisdom and the maturity and the integrity that needs to be attached to it. His ways are higher. And so I want to show you a passage of scripture where God invites someone to come higher. He actually physically has to move higher to hear God speak about what is higher. This man's life is called for greatness so much higher than he had asked or imagined. But God wants to take him on a journey and the journey is all about him seeing more clearly the things that God has assigned for his life. 
And yet it's a difficult story because the story almost seems like it's a negative story because it's a story where God asks something that seems so unkind. It's the story in Genesis 22 of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham is going to be shown what is higher for his life, the call that God has on his life, but it's going to be costly for him to take the steps to see what it is that God wants him to see. And in Genesis 22, the passage of Scripture even begins with the heading, Abraham is tested. Well, a lot of us already don't like this Scripture (laughs) because we don't like to be tested, right? We're like, can we just go to the Scripture about Abraham is blessed? Can we skip the test part? And I want to help today, church. For some of us, the word testing, we get stuck. We feel if we're being tested, we're being punished. We feel if we're being tested, God's angry with us. We feel if we're being tested, somehow we're failing. But God is only testing you because he wants to promote you. God's testing is all about promoting you to a next season. In other words, if I was to go today to sit my driving test, is the instructor trying to punish me or promote me? I'm sitting a test because I've done enough lessons that mean I can now sit in a test situation and at the other side of the test, I will be given the keys and the freedom to take the vehicle by myself. But without the test, I don't get the freedom. And it's the same with God. God's like, I've seen you sit the lesson about your integrity. I've seen you sit the lesson about the way you handle your finances. I've seen you sit the lesson about the way you talk and your confession. I think you're ready for a test. And at the other side of this test are the keys to the next season of your life, the freedom that I have for you. God is not testing you to punish you. He is testing you because he's ready to promote you. So we have to flip the way that we view God's testing in our life and say, God, I want you to bring on the test because if the test means I get to go higher, then I'm all about getting to go higher. And so God comes and he's about to take Abraham on a three-step process of where he takes him from where he is to where God needs him to be to show him what he needs to show him. Maybe over this 21 days, church, as you get ready to go towards that in your mind and in your heart, maybe if you can think about this process, God can take you on a journey as you pray of showing you what he has for you and taking you through these steps that we're going to see Abraham go through. He went through the step of elevation, which led to the step of preparation, which led to the step of revelation. So let's go all the way back to the first step. It says that in verse one, sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, here I am. He replied, do you remember when you're back in school, some of you have to take your mind way, way back. <laughs> remember when you're in school and the teacher would call your name? And at the sound of your name, you'd need to say, here I am, here sir, to let the teacher know I'm present. I showed up today to learn what I need to learn. I'm in class, I'm situated, I'm in my seat. A lot of times God wants to begin the journey of taking us higher, not first of all with the elevation, but first of all with your location. God's like, hey, I'm calling you, and he's just waiting for, here I am, and he doesn't want the fake here I am. (laughs) Here I am, everything's perfect, everything's great, my marriage is amazing, my kids are angels, it's all great, yes, here I am. No, he doesn't want that, here I am, because he knows it's not where you are. That's where you were for the hour in front of your other church friends, and then you got in the car, and the real here I am showed up. (laughs) Here I am, I'm grumpy, I'm moody, I'm short-tempered, I'm depressed, I'm frustrated, I'm striving. God's like, I already knew that's where you really were, and God's kind of doing a call. Maybe at the beginning of 21 days, you, you can hear him call your name afresh. He's like, Charlotte, and you're like, here I am. God's like, just start with where you are because then I can help you get to where you need to go. It's like when you're lost in your vehicle, hello, and you're like, I'm good, I'm gonna figure this out. And then you circle the block and then you circle it one more time and you circle it one more time and everyone in the car's like, we're lost. (laughs) All my men friends in the house, I love you all, but there's a moment in your life where you just need to say, you're right, I am lost. (laughs) and put the window down and swallow the pride and say, help me, how do I get out of this neighborhood? Here I am. 
from your elevation begins from your location. So he says, here I am, and God says, I'm going to ask you right now to do something. It's going to ask you to go on a climb. You're going to have to come higher. He says, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moira and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. I mean, let's just stop for a moment. That is a lot of information. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'd be like, okay, time out. I am needing to go and process this. In fact, I need to go rebuke this. I don't think this can be God because what you have to understand is when God calls us higher, when he calls us to increase, it always first involves decrease. The elevation that God is after for your life is not about accumulation, it's about consecration. That God's saying, hey, if you want to go higher, then it means that actually you must decrease so I can increase. That's the whole way that God works. The world works, works the complete opposite way. But God's way is, hey, less of you and more of me. And so God comes, he says, I, I want you to lay down your only son. Well, wait a minute, is God confused? Because he didn't just have one son. But the word here only, the root word, means your unique promise. He's not after the thing that you produced in your own strength. He's not after the thing that striving created. He's not after what you did because you couldn't be patient to wait. I'm asking for the unique thing that I entrusted to your life, the gift that I have put in your hands. I'm asking for you to lay that down. I think we're in a time and in a season where God's like, I need to know, does this have a bigger grip on you or do I have a bigger grip on you? Is this about you or is this about me? Is this for your glory and your getting higher? Or is this for my glory and me becoming higher? I need you to lay it down. You should never fear when God asks you to lay down the things that he has promised attached to it. You should never fear. I've just been through a season, if I'm really honest, of laying down some huge things like a ministry that I'd worked and built for 20 years and it was very successful and reaching a lot of people. And I just heard God say, time to lay it down. It wasn't that it was wrong. It wasn't that there was anything in it that wasn't God honoring. But when God says, lay it down, you lay it down. Yes. <laughs> He's God, I'm not. Yeah. And some of us can't get to the next level because we won't lay down what God needs us to lay down. And then God says, go to the mountain that I will show you. So many of us are tired because we're up the wrong mountain. <laughs> climbing the mountain of our career, climbing the mountain of our striving, climbing the mountain of our whatever it is we've decided we want to achieve. And then we're like, God, could you help me out? And God's like, you're on your own, mate. <laughs> you're on the wrong mountain. There's grace on this mountain. There's mercy on this mountain. There's favor on this mountain. But this mountain is to do with striving. This mountain's to do with you, not me. This mountain is what you chose. And I just wonder if there's just some time that we have to create before God and God show me the mountain. And you want God to say, oh, I'm going to take up the mountain of financial breakthrough. That's awesome. But maybe he's going to say that one will come after the marriage breakthrough. That will come after we get some things dealt with in your life and in your relationship life. That's the first mountain that I need you to go up. And so I think it's time for us to stop picking mountains randomly and submit and say, God, show me. I want to go to the height that you have for me in this season. And it's important that God shows us the mountain because the elevation then instructs the preparation. Once you know the mountain God's got and called you to, that begins to instruct you with how you prepare. If you said to me today, hey, Charlotte, after service, let's go up the mountain of Alabama, because apparently you have one. <laughs> let's go up the mountain of Alabama, and I would be like, awesome, let me just go and pack for our outing. And I would go and I would prepare a picnic blanket and I would prepare my camera and I would prepare some snacks because we're going up the mountain of Alabama. <laughs> but if you said to me, hey, after service, let's do something crazy and let's all go to Everest and climb Mount Everest. How many of you know I am not packing my picnic blanket? 
I am not packing my sunscreen. I am not packing my selfie stick because I'm going to need some serious equipment to get me up that mountain. That's why we need to know the mountain because the elevation instructs the preparation. God, if you're calling me up this mountain, I think this is what it's going to cost. I think this is what it's going to require. And verse 3 is a verse that I do not think would be written if this was my story. I'm just being honest. Because after God tells him the mountain which is going to amount to sacrifice his son, after God just tells him that information, verse 3 says, early the next morning. <laughs> just imagine him jumping out. Let's go. Chopping the wood. He says he chopped the wood. He loaded the donkey. If this was written about me, it would say early the next morning, Charlotte put a note out on Facebook and told everybody, rebuke the devil from my life. I'm having some crazy thoughts and I do not want to entertain them. I think I would be having meetings about the thing that I thought I'd heard. I'd be having discussions and I'd be asking everyone's opinion and that's the problem. God shows some of us the mountain and between obedience, we put delay. We're asking for everybody's opinion. We want everybody to have a say. And sometimes you have to realize God showed you it. Now you need to do it. It's going to be easy to be talked out of some of the places that God needs your obedience if you put delay in. Did God really say? Are you sure? But early the next morning, he starts preparing and he prepares the wood. The Bible says he chopped the wood. Every time he chopped the wood, he was saying to himself, I don't understand God, but I trust God. I don't know why I'm doing this, God, but I am doing it out of an obedience. God, I don't know how this is going to play out, but God, I'm preparing what you asked me to prepare to do what you asked me to do. And no, he didn't prepare the wood and a ram. <laughs> okay, God, I prepared wood, but just in case you don't come through, I brought a ram. I'll just help you out, Lord, in case this plan does not go the way I would like it to go. He had complete trust. God's asked me to go up this mountain, and I need to chop the wood. And then it says that he took two servants with him. And these two servants came with him, and they were journeying with him, but he didn't take 12 servants. He didn't take 20 servants. He didn't put a Facebook post out saying, who'd like to come up the mountain? Because he realized where I'm going, not everybody can go with me. And where I'm going, not everybody's going to understand why I'm doing this. And so in order to get to a place of obedience, he had to remove interference. My sister moved to Switzerland, and you can't ever go anywhere in Switzerland without going up some kind of mountain. And I noticed how as a family, we'd all be chatting at the bottom of the mountain and talking and laughing. And, but as we started to go higher up the mountain, the conversation got less. And it wasn't that we didn't want to talk. It wasn't that we didn't have anything to say, but the air was thinner. Right. And because the air was thinner, our words had to be more measured. And what was okay down here was not okay up here. Some of you need to understand that, that God's asking you to come up higher, but that's going to change the conversations. It's going to change the company. And you have to be prepared to chop the wood. You have to be prepared to say, I can't talk about that now because I don't have enough air to talk about that issue that belongs down there. Now's not the time for a group chat on the side of the mountain. Now is not a time to discuss, did God say, is God, like, that's not the time. I, I want to be family to you always, so I'm just going to say it, and then I can leave, and it'll all be good, and PC will be back, and I'll be good. But the truth is that some of you have got a lot of words about a lot of things. And all of a sudden, the church has become this place where we all have an opinion, and we all have criticism, and we all make a comment, and we're not, we want this to be said, and we want that to be said. And I'm like, wow, you have a lot of time to use a lot of words. I think you must be at the bottom of a mountain. Because when you're up the side of the mountain, you don't have time for that. You're like, I don't have time to have that conversation. Do you not see? The air is thin. I need to use my words wisely. I need a conversation that stops someone dropping off the mountain. I need to say to people, watch your foot. I don't have time for that. And 
Some of you, it's time to get out of some conversations that are not helping you go higher, but they are keeping you lower. It's time to get out of some company that is not helping you go higher, but it is keeping you lower. And we do it with love and we do it with grace, but you have to say, my obedience to God is more important than pleasing this people that are keeping me at the bottom of the same mountain. He was prepared to chop the wood. He was prepared for the hard conversation. He gets to one stage with the two servants and the Bible says, he says to them, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. He's even prepared to say, hey, you, thank you for coming thus far, but I'm about to do this last leg of obedience and you're gonna try and talk me out of it when you see the knife. It's like some of you are like, I'm so in, and I'm gonna go to growth track. And then you told someone, they're like, yeah, we'll do it next time. Well, does it really matter? You were like, yes, I'm gonna get baptized. Then you told that person, they're like, yeah, but maybe you don't wanna do that yet. You know what I'm saying? You get to a certain point, and they go all the way back down. So you have to get to a certain point and go, I don't know that I need to ask about that at this point. And he says, I don't know, he's think, I don't know what's coming next, but my language is gonna be careful. He says, we're going to worship. <laughs> he can go, we're gonna, we're gonna go, and I'm gonna kill my son. <laughs> That's not the time to say that. We're gonna go, and it's gonna be a mess. It's gonna be hard. It's gonna be so difficult. He doesn't say that. We're gonna go and I have no idea if I'm coming back, the boy's coming back. He doesn't say that. He says, we're going to worship and then we're gonna come back. Just this confidence that he's prepared in his heart to go through with what is so difficult, but he calls it worship. And by the way, if you wanna be a worship leader, that's the definition of worship. It's all about sacrifice. We need to rename the worship team. Would anyone like to sign up for the sacrifice team? They'll run out the building. No thanks, I thought it was about a shiny mic and singing with Brooke. No, it's about sacrifice. I bring a sacrifice of praise. Finally, he gets higher up the mountain. He's even prepared for the difficult conversation because at some point, Isaac turns around and says, hey, Dad, what's the deal? If you can't have the hard conversations, you won't get up the mountain. And the higher he goes, his perspective starts to change. And the higher you go, your perspective will start to change. And what seems impossible suddenly seems possible. And what seems unclear suddenly seems clear. As you go higher, your vision changes. The air changes. And as he gets to the place where he lifts the knife and he's bound his son and he lays him down and he's done everything that God asks him to do, suddenly it says that he hears the voice again as the Lord calls, Abraham, here I am. But the second here I am is not the same as the first here I am. The first here I am was at the foot of the mountain. The second here I am is in the place of obedience. And just so that you know, between the first Abraham and the second Abraham, God has said nothing. <laughs> You're like, God, really? Like you couldn't on the side of the mountain show up and go, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> like I could have really done with the encouragement when I left the two servants behind. I could have really done with you showing up when I had the hard conversation with Isaac. God's like, no, I don't need to say anything until you get to the place I told you to get to. Wow. Some of you have stopped because you're like, but God, I need you to speak. God's like, I did speak. I told you what to do. Get to the place of obedience. Abraham, here I am. And then God says, don't lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up and he saw the ram in the thicket. And then Abraham does something. He says, I name this man. I name it Jehovah Jireh. 
because the elevation led me to preparation and the preparation has brought me to a place of revelation and I heard you were a provider but now I see I have a revelation you are my provider and no one can make me unsee what I have seen but I couldn't see at the bottom of the mountain but at the top of the mountain I know that I know that I know you are my provider I name this mountain Jehovah Jireh that he wants to birth on the inside of you that no man can steal from you. He wants to show you I'm your provider. He wants to show you I'm your healer. He wants to show you I am the one that makes the way where there is no way. But you have to come higher. I have a friend and he has a farm and he built some wind turbines on his farm. And I said to him, why so high? He said, I have to get them beyond the buildings, beyond the infrastructure, beyond all the things that man has made. I have to get them higher because higher is where the purest wind is and that wind is renewable energy and that wind can power things like nothing else can power things in church. There is a wind we've got to catch that becomes renewable energy for our marriages and our life and our future and it doesn't run out. Today, church, God is inviting you as an individual, He's inviting us as His followers to come higher. God, I pray right now over the house, I pray right now over every family, every individual. Oh God, some of them are so stuck right now and they've not had language, but they feel stuck. And today, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would help them become unstuck. Some are on the wrong mountain. I pray today they would say, God, show me the mountain. I pray as they get ready to head towards 21 days of prayer, that our posture would be, God, whatever you ask me to lay down, I'll lay down. And whatever you ask me to sacrifice, I will sacrifice. God, I want to go higher. God, I pray the church would catch the words that become renewable energy to our soul. And if you're in the house today, just as eyes are closed, and you say, I don't know, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. I've backslidden from him. I've gone my own way. Today, the mountain he wants to show you is the mountain called salvation, forgiveness, a new start. And if you say, today, I know that's where it begins for me. That's the here I am. That's where I am. And I simply want you to say, that's me. And I want you to lift your hand and say, today, I need a new start. Today, I need forgiveness. Today, I need to come back to him all across the room on every campus. Just lift your hand. It's the beginning of a journey. The beginning of going up the right mountain, so many of you. So grateful for your honesty in this moment. God will meet you there. Just put your hand on your heart. I'm just going to ask this church to pray this prayer together. I want us all to say it together to help these people make this decision. So say these words. Dear God, today I lay my life down and I receive your love. Thank you, Jesus that you sacrificed for me, that you love me, that you forgive me. And today I begin the journey of following you as Lord and Savior in your name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's welcome